gout, not just the rich and gluttonous. After the completion of this presentation, the viewer should be able to describe the cause, frequency, and implications of gout, outline the non-pharmacological methods used to treat gout, and be able to compare and contrast the most common medications used to treat gout, including their mechanisms of action and their potential side effects. Arthritis is a Latin word meaning inflamed joint, and collectively it's a major cause of disability in the United States. There are many types of arthritis, in fact over 100, and osteoarthritis is considered the most common in the U.S. and most other countries, but gout is common also, and it's increasing among Americans. In fact, gout is the most common inflammatory type of arthritis among middle-aged men. Gout involves lots of pain and inflammation. So in terms of differential diagnosis, it's closer to rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, as opposed to osteoarthritis, or OA. And chronic gout can be very destructive to joints. Gout essentially is the overproduction and or under excretion of uric acid and that leads to the, the deposit of sharp crystals in and around joints. Any joint in the body can be involved but the feet, particularly the large toes and the hands are most often affected. High risk factors include certain medications, certain types of alcohol and a number of purine rich foods. Gout is often classified as either acute, recurrent, or chronic. In its chronic stage, it's often called gouty arthritis. At least 6 million Americans, and possibly as high as 8 million, suffer from gout. Gout is actually the oldest recognized form of arthritis. The ancient Egyptians, approximately 4,000 years ago, discuss the symptoms and possible treatments for gout. And years later it was well described by Galen and Hippocrates, who were recognized as the fathers, or maybe more appropriately the grandfathers, of modern medicine. At about the time of Hippocrates, gout was nicknamed podagra, which is a Greek word for foot trap or foot pain. During the Middle Ages, gout was also called the disease of kings because of its correlation to overindulgence of certain foods and alcoholic beverages that only the rich and powerful could afford during that time. The uric acid crystals in gout were first observed microscopically in the year 1684. Gout occurs when excess uric acid and this is normally a waste product that's easily removed from the body by the kidneys, collects in the blood. High levels of uric acid in the blood is referred to as hyperuricemia. And when it collects in the blood, it can precipitate into needle-like monosodium urate crystals. And these can deposit within joints and surrounding soft tissues, such as ligaments and tendons. And ultimately, these crystals can get deposited in organs. Uric acid is a byproduct resulting from the metabolism of purines. And I'll discuss what those are in the next few slides. Hyperuricemia occurs because, number one, uric acid production increases due to dietary factors and also increased production in the liver. Or number two, the kidneys cannot remove the uric acid from the blood fast enough. It's important to note that under-excretion by the kidneys is the most common cause of hyperuricemia and gout, and it's thought to account for up to 80 to 90 percent of cases. Most of the time, uric acid accumulation in the blood is not harmful, nor does it lead to gout, although once the precipitation point is reached, crystal deposition quickly leads to symptoms such as pain and inflammation. The process from hyperuricemia to gout begins with the metabolism of purines. And purines are nitrogen-containing building blocks primarily used to make RNA and DNA. And the issue is that they're metabolized into uric acid. 
Purines are of two types. Endogenous purines are made within cells, especially liver cells, and that accounts for 65% of purines. And the other type is exogenous purines obtained from food, and that accounts for roughly 35%. Most mammals have an enzyme called uricase within their bodies, and this degrades uric acid so that it's easily removed by the kidneys. However, humans and other higher primates lack this enzyme uricase and are therefore vulnerable to uric acid buildup and hyperuricemia. Uric acid concentrations in the blood should be below 6.8 milligrams per deciliter, and some sources recommend it being closer to 6. Uric acid levels greater than 7 mg per deciliter significantly increase the likelihood of sharp salt crystals precipitating out of solution and depositing in and around joints. And as noted, this crystal deposition triggers intense inflammation and pain, and it marks a transition from hyperuricemia to full-blown gout. Gout is usually divided into four distinct stages. Stage number one is called asymptomatic tissue deposition, and this is characterized by hyperuricemia, crystal precipitation and deposition, but no overt symptoms. Stage number two is the acute flare, and this occurs when the crystals do cause intense symptoms, such as inflammation, pain, redness, and warmth around the affected joint and these acute flares can last days or weeks. 78% of people suffer a second acute gout attack within two years of their first. The third stage of gout is called intercritical segments, and these are sort of a latent period, lasting weeks, months, even years, and they occur after the flare-ups have settled down. Very little symptomatology is noticed during these segments, and they typically become shorter as gout progresses. During these segments, there's still hyperuricemia and there's still crystal deposition around joints. But of course, the symptoms are very little to nil. The final stage of gout, and not all people progress to this stage, but the final stage is called chron chronic gout or gouty arthritis, and is characterized by a little lower level of chronic joint pain, joint disfiguration, and the formation of tophi, which are clumps of crystals deposited on or near the skin's surface. Tophi usually form in cooler areas of the body. That cooler temperature allows the, the, the crystals to clump and precipitate easier. The cooler areas include the ears, elbows, and distal finger joints. With the formation of tophi in and around joints, the likelihood of joint destruction increases greatly. Here we have a diagram to the right called the spiral of gout, and that refers to the, the cycle or the feedback loop of gout. And essentially it's reduced pH or increased acidity in the blood and other body fluids. That's the important factor for crystal precipitation. And as previously mentioned, a lower temperature is also important for precipitation. And here we have in the diagram as the crystals form they can pop or pierce the cells, and that causes proteins to leak out into the interstitial spaces. And the body reacts by sending in more white blood cells, which causes more inflammation and pain. And the proteins also lower the pH, making it possible for more crystals to form. And in around and around this spiral or cycle goes. As I alluded to earlier, one of the main symptoms of gout is joint pain, in particular severe, intense, burning joint pain. However, sometimes the pain can be more mild with chronic gout. The pain is not always constant because some acute attacks are characterized by brief twinges of pain, sometimes referred to as petite attacks. And these can last several months or years before the full-blown condition presents. These painful acute attacks typically escalate over two to six hours. And like I mentioned, they can last many days or weeks. People sometimes describe the pain as a 
crushing or a dislocating sort of a feeling over the joint and around the joint. In addition to pain, there's usually at least moderate amounts of joint inflammation. And of course, with the inflammation comes a significant degree of warmth that can be felt at the back of your hand, sometimes an inch or so away from the joint. It's quite noticeable. There's also red and shiny skin with the inflammation. And sometimes or often that skin will peel a few days or a week later. Sometimes chills and mild fevers are involved, as well as loss of appetite and a general malaise feeling. Crystals may also form in the kidneys, creating kidney stones. Physical activity and even the lightest pressure, such as from bed sheets, is often unbearable and impossible to do. Acute attacks often peak late at night or early in the morning, and that's because the body temperature is lower, so typically they'll wake people up in the middle of the night. The symptoms of gout often start in a single joint, but may eventually involve many. However, they're almost always in a unilateral presentation, which means on one side of the body. And this is a characteristic of gout that can distinguish it from RA or OA, which typically happen bilaterally or on both sides of the body at the same time. Gout swelling can extend well beyond the affected joint and sometimes mimic a generalized edema. For example, gout of the big toe can involve swelling around the joint but also of the entire foot. But again, it would be just unilaterally. Uric acid levels may be normal in up to 50% of patients with acute flares, which is surprising. So hyperuricemia doesn't always have to be present. Gout may present differently in the elderly. Typically, more joints are affected, but again, it would be unilaterally. So instead of just the big toe joint being affected, an elderly person may have three or four joints in the same foot affected by gout. The formation of extensive tophi may lead to extensive erosion and joint destruction. And to further complicate matters, gout can occur along with other types of arthritis, such as OA and RA, concurrently. Well, hyperuricemia, or high uric acid in the blood, is a risk factor. But actually, less than 20% of cases with hyperuricemia develop into gout. And that's because people eat different things, there's dietary factors involved, the pH of the blood and body fluids differs from person to person, and also kidney function is a factor as well. So some people have hyperuricemia, but because of a higher pH and a more efficient kidneys, and the fact they eat uh, maybe a low purine diet, they're not going to develop gout. Kidney disease and hypertension is another risk factor because it reduces the ability to excrete uric acid by the kidneys. Age, in general terms, the older the person is, the more risk there is of developing gout, and the same goes with obesity. Higher BMI is related to higher risk of gout. Weight loss, in general, reduces the risk, although if the weight loss is sudden due to an illness or overuse of medication, then that can actually trigger an acute flare. Men are at much higher risk, especially during the middle age, let's say 30 to 50 years compared to women. But by about age 65, there's no real gender bias. And after the age of 80, gout is more common in women. Genetics also play a factor. About 20% of people with gout have a positive family history for the condition. And there are several genes that are linked to purine and uric acid metabolism and breakdown. Dietary factors, of course, and we'll get into that in a little more detail in the next few slides. Red meat, especially organ meats, seafood, and alcohol, particularly beer and spirits, increase the risk for gout. Medications are also involved, in particular certain diuretics, low-dose aspirin, L-dopa, cyclosporin, and also niacin. 
Triggers are events or conditions that can set off an acute gout flare. And they include a purine-rich diet. And we'll discuss that in the next slide. Binge drinking, particularly beer. A joint injury, for example, a bunion or a turf toe, which is a sprain or strain of the big toe, that can precipitate a gout attack there if there's hyperuricemia or other factors. Dehydration can also trigger gout, as can severe illnesses or infections. Acidosis is important because that lowers the pH. So people that maybe drink a lot of coffee, medications are also acidic. Uh, meat, of course, protein is acidic. Preservatives, processed food, sugar, processed sugar. Uh, these all reduce the pH in the, in the body somewhat and it can cause acidosis and trigger a gout attack. Sudden weight loss, as I mentioned, a crash dieting. Surgeries, not just of the feet, but anywhere in the body, lowers the body's immune system and ability to fight certain things. Kidney transplants in particular can precipitate gout. Radiation therapy and chemotherapy, and also lead exposure. Dietary factors used to be considered the primary link to gout. And you'll have to excuse me for sounding cynical, but because there's no money in dietary change, I believe modern medicine has relegated diet down the list of risk factors. For example, modern medicine estimates that dietary factors account for only 12% of gout. But really, they're only accounting for the purines. And purines don't make the biggest impact because, as I said in a previous slide, dietary purines only account for 35% of what exists in the body. The other 65% are made in body cells, in particular the liver. But I think diet plays a bigger factor because we also have to account for the acidity of foods, which drive down body pH, and also the various preservatives and chemicals that injure and damage the kidneys and liver and reduce their ability to excrete uric acid. So I think dietary factors are much more important, but modern medicine recognizes them further down the list. Some of the biggest offenders are fructose sweetened drinks and baked goods. These items inhibit uric acid excretion and they also dramatically reduce pH in the body. Red meats such as beef, pork, lamb, especially liver and kidneys, are very high in purines and they also reduce pH. As does seafood such as shellfish, mussels, anchovies, sardines and herring. Some vegetables such as mushrooms and asparagus are high in purines, but there's some conflicting data. Some studies suggest that plant-based purines do not increase the risk of gout. Low purine diets can reduce uric acid levels by up to 1 mg per deciliter, which can be significant. It can take a person, say, from 7.8 mg per deciliter, which is considered hyperuricemia, down to 6.8, which of course is the safer zone. In contrast, low-calorie diets, at least for men who are obese, can reduce uric acid levels by a bit more, up to 1.7 mg per deciliter. Alkaline diets, especially ones high in vitamin C, may make more impact on reducing the risk of gout because they reduce acidity in the body, in other words, they increase pH, which allows the tophi to dissolve partially, and it also inhibits the deposition and precipitation of crystals. Drinking lots of alcohol, especially binge drinking, significantly increases the risk of gout and is a known trigger for acute flares. Beer is most strongly linked to gout, followed by the more sugary spirits, such as whiskey or dark rum, and then vodka and gin. Light to moderate wine drinking, whether it be red or white wine, does not seem to increase the risk of gout, according to some studies, but in my opinion, the acidity of the wine would certainly be an issue. Binge drinking spikes uric acid levels in the blood because it provides an additional source of purines, it intensifies the body's production of uric acid, and it also lowers the kidney's ability to excrete it. Alcohol may play a lesser role among the elderly uh, in terms of gout risk, especially in postmenopausal women. 
A Rochester epidemiology project study showed an increase in the incidence of gout from about 45 per 100,000 Americans in 1977 to 78 up to 63 per 100,000 in 95 96, which is an increase of about 40%. The overall male to female ratios were about 3.3 to 1 during both the 77-78 and the 95-96 time periods. For those 65 and younger, rates among men were four times those of women. Although these differences start to even out beyond the age of 65. And as I mentioned, at age 80 and beyond, women are more at risk for gout than men. Considering just primary gout, in other words, excluding secondary gout, which is people that develop gout because they're on diuretics, the incidence increased from 20 to 46 per 100,000 in those 18 years. The cumulative incidence of gout among black men was almost twice that compared to white men, 11% of the group compared to 6%. And again, at least 6 million, and some studies claim up to 8.3 million American adults currently have gout. So gout usually occurs in men in their mid-40s, especially those who are obese, hypertensive, eat meat, and drink alcohol, particularly beer. A number of things should be done before you diagnose gout. For example, a medical history in order to establish possible familial or genetic links, history of joint trauma, such as bunions or any old fractures, and even concurrent arthritis, such as OA and RA. A physical exam checks for joint tenderness. In general, a quick onset of pain and swelling points to gout, but so does infection, so infection must be ruled out. Imaging, such as x-rays, MRI, CT scans, are useful in identifying chronic gout, primarily because of the bone destruction, but they're not much help in establishing acute gout attacks. Therefore, the gold standard for diagnosing gout is joint aspiration and microscopic analysis for urate crystals in synovial fluid. Secondary tests, blood tests for example, can measure uric acid levels and be helpful, but hyperuricemia is no guarantee of gout and vice versa. Urine tests can also measure uric acid, and high levels in the urine increase the risk of developing kidney stones. Other types of arthritis and joint conditions can mimic acute or chronic gout, and these include septic arthritis or infection, but of course with this condition you'll usually get an increase in body temperature and some other symptoms. RA, RA is certainly more inflammatory than OA, but you can test for rheumatoid factor in the blood and rule that out pretty quickly. Turf toe, which is a sprain and strain that a lot of athletes develop in the big toe. Bunion, of course, uh, common in women who insist on squeezing their feet into uh, high heel shoes with a, a short and narrow toe cap. Pseudo gout, similar to gout except it, is, uh, it involves the deposit of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals little different, so joint aspiration would show those types of crystals as opposed to the urate ones. Charcot joint, which is basically neuropathic arthropathy, uh, and is associated with advanced diabetes, can mimic gout, and it's also quite destructive to joints. And due to tophi formation and chronic gout, that can mimic basal cell carcinoma on the skin. As I stated, uh, imaging such as x-ray, MRI, or CT scan is not very helpful for acute gout attacks, but it can be quite helpful for chronic gout. Here we have an image to the right. It's a view of the right foot showing gout progression and joint destruction. On the far right image, we have mild to moderate gout. You can see a little bit of effusion and joint swelling. And then on the image right next to it to the left, of course, there's a lot more inflammation, formation of tophi, and quite a bit of joint erosion and bone destruction. On the lower left image of the hand, it's a view of the right hand. 
and it's showing moderate to severe chronic gout, swelling and crystal deposits in the middle finger. We don't have a lot of joint erosion and bone destruction yet, but certainly this is along that developmental path. Just to give you a better idea of what TOFI looks like, here are three photographs, the top left one of the elbow obviously, and you can see how it deposits right around the joint but also perforates the skin and can form uh, crusty crystals on the surface of the skin. The right image is of the ear, and you can see how that might mimic uh, basal cell carcinoma or other types of skin cancer upon first glance. More of a close-up view of the finger and you can see how those crystals are coming through the skin and forming on the surface. 50 to 60 percent of first-time gout attacks affect the big toe and this is unilaterally or on one side of the body as gout rarely if ever affects the body bilaterally at the same time. About 80% of people with gout eventually will experience podagra at some stage. Uric acid levels may be normal in up to 50% of patients with podagra. So hyperuricemia does not guarantee gout and vice versa. Decreased local body temperature, lower pH or more acidity, and physical trauma all contribute to the formation of podagra. So again, an old fracture of the big toe, bunion, turf toe, or perhaps the big toe joint has a little bit of OA or RA in it. These are all increased risk factors for podagra. There are a number of natural approaches to gout, and these can be divided into different categories, such as lifestyle changes. We talked about a few of these, such as weight loss, although it should be gradual, not sudden, reducing stress and blood pressure, limiting high purine foods and alcohol, especially beer, a more alkaline diet such as fruits and vegetables increase the body's pH, and drinking more water, natural juice, and even milk in order to flush out these uric acid crystals. Devices, for example custom-made foot orthotics or orthopedic shoes can alleviate pain from gouty toes and feet, and this also applies to people with OA, RA, or other joint problems. Sandals, flip-flops, moccasins, and ill-fitting sneakers can actually contribute to gout pain and cause more problems. Chiropractors, podiatrists, and even some medical doctors are trained at making foot orthotics or orthopedic shoes. Acupuncture can be quite effective for pain and inflammation control. and I'll talk more about that in a coming slide. Herbal remedies. Some herbs, of course, are anti-inflammatory and analgesic. We'll talk about that more as well. And there's other natural compounds that can be very helpful for gout, including vitamin C, omega-3 fats, MSM, folic acid, and bromelain. The American Dietetic Association recommends the following. Drink between 8 and 16 cups, which is between 2 and 4 liters, of non-caffeinated fluid daily, with at least half being purified water. Of course, fresh juice, juice and milk can be included in there as well. Avoid alcohol consumption, particularly beer, and don't binge drink. Eat a moderate amount of low purine protein, preferably from healthy sources such as low-fat dairy, tofu, eggs. Consume low-fat dairy products, milk and yogurt are a good idea, and they may actually protect against gout attacks, because although they do contain some protein, they can be alkalizing due to their mineral content. Limit your daily intake of high purine foods such as meat, fish, and pork to four to six ounces at most. And consume lots of alkalizing fruits and veggies such as citrus fruit, cherries, watermelon, and bell peppers. Several controlled clinical trials suggest that the ancient Chinese practice of acupuncture, which of course is sticking fine needles into the skin, works effectively to treat all sorts of arthritic pain, including gout, OA, RA, etc. And it does this by stimulating endorphins, which are the body's natural pain relievers. Perhaps surprisingly, acupuncture can also reduce uric acid levels in blood and improve kidney function. And this has been measured by urinary protein and creatinine. 
Therefore, acupuncture is a good complementary treatment and possibly effective as a primary therapy for gout. And one Chinese study found it reached a 95% effectiveness for all parameters such as pain level, joint inflammation, urinary protein, etc. So acupuncture can be, in some cases, extremely effective. And perhaps the best thing about it is, acupuncture has no significant negative side effects. Turmeric root is a good anti-inflammatory and analgesic. It actually performs as well as ibuprofen and diclofenac in certain studies, but without the side effects. Extract doses range from between 400 to 600 milligrams three times daily for acute flares, but it's also a blood thinner, so it shouldn't be taken with Coumadin or other medications that thin the blood. Cat's claw is also a good anti-inflammatory, an antioxidant and immune booster, and is used to treat all types of arthritis, including gout. Extract doses range from between 30 to 300 milligrams daily. It also acts as a diuretic and a vasodilator. Devil's Claw is a good anti-inflammatory and analgesic too. Some studies indicate that taking Devil's Claw for between 8 to 12 weeks reduces joint pain, especially in larger joints. Extract doses range from between 200 to 400 milligrams two times daily for chronic gout. It also is a blood thinner and a vasodilator. Ginger root blocks COX-2 production and reduces inflammation, much like Celebrex does. At least 2,500 milligrams per day, in divided doses, is needed to be effective for gout. And again, ginger root is a blood thinner. Elf-elf is a good natural diuretic, and it helps to increase secretion of uric acid in the urine, which reduces the amount available to crystallize. At least 3,000 milligrams daily, and it is available in tablets, is helpful for gout. Alfalfa is also a strong alkalizer and able to increase the body's pH. Capsaicin is derived from cayenne peppers and usually applied as a cream. It helps to reduce, at least short term, substance P, a chemical component of nerve cells that transmit pain signals to the brain. It's important to note that capsaicin doesn't reduce joint swelling though. Tart cherries contain two powerful compounds, anthocyanins and bioflavonoids, and both slow down the enzymes COX-1 and COX-2, which helps to relieve pain and inflammation. Tart cherries are also a good source of vitamin C and other antioxidants, which not only helps repair and prevent tissue damage, but as I mentioned earlier, vitamin C also increases the body's pH and helps prevent crystal precipitation. Eating a large bowl of tart cherries and I'm talking about at least one pound, can alleviate acute gout overnight. It acts as a great alkalizer. Eating more moderate amounts of cherries daily for two weeks can lower uric acid levels and prevent further attacks and prevent chronic gout. Tart cherry juice extracts are also available, and uh, some of them are strong enough such that one teaspoon of the juice extract is equivalent to about 50 cherries. Other beneficial fruit for gout include blueberries, strawberries, and hawthorn berries. As I've alluded to in previous slides, vitamin C is very important. Now the RDA is between 70 and 120 milligrams per day, depending on gender and age, but this is far too low in my opinion, because people and higher primates do not produce vitamin C, we're one of the very few mammals that do not. Regardless, vitamin C may help prevent formation of uric acid crystals by increasing the pH. An intake of at least 1,500 milligrams per day has been found to decrease the risk of gout by 45%. Vitamin C is also needed for tissue repair, in particular collagen, and it acts as a mild anti-inflammatory, believe it or not. Megadoses beyond 3,000 milligrams may increase uric acid levels, according to some studies, but that's kind of a myth that's been propagated uh, for about 30 to 40 years now. I don't believe that's the case. Another dietary supplement is omega-3 fats, and these include ALA, EPA, and DHA. They have strong anti-inflammatory properties, and they also aid in tissue repair. EPA and DHA are found primarily in fish oils, 
ALA and flaxseed, hemp, and even walnuts. 1,000 milligrams of these fats two to four times daily, so we're talking up to four, possibly 5,000 milligrams in a day, uh, need to be taken for noticeable anti-inflammatory effects. MSM is another decent dietary supplement for gout. That stands for methylsulfonyl methane. It's a good anti-inflammatory and a mild analgesic. Probably best for chronic gout. Three to 4,000 milligrams twice daily can impact gout and arthritic pain after a few days or so. Another decent supplement for gout is folic acid. Folic acid is the name for vitamin B9 when it's made synthetically. Uh, when it's found in food, it's called folate. RDA is between 400 and 600 micrograms per day, which again to me is quite low because what we're talking about taking for gout is between 10 and 75 milligrams. And uh, when you take that much, it seems to inhibit xanthine oxidase, which is an enzyme required for uric acid production in the liver. If you're going to take natural sources, which would be called folate, the best sources are beef liver, spinach, black-eyed peas. Although, of course, beef liver is going to have quite a bit of purines, so you might want to stick with the spinach and the black-eyed peas. Bromelain is another great uh, supplement, helpful for gout. It's a proteolytic uh, enzyme found primarily in pineapples. It's a strong anti-inflammatory and it improves digestion metabolism of protein and purines. Between 150 and 250 milligrams three times daily is helpful during an acute attack. And bromelain is often combined with turmeric for synergistic effects at preventing and dealing with gout. The goals of drug therapy for gout are to stop the pain of acute flares, prevent future attacks, and combat the formation of tophi and even kidney stones. Therapy for acute flares consists of NSAIDs, but not aspirin. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Colchicine, also pronounced colchicine, and steroidal anti-inflammatories. Preventative therapy to lower serum uric acid levels involves xanthine oxidase inhibitors, such as allopurinol and febuxostat. Uricosuric agents increase elimination of uric acid by the kidneys, and uh, the most common drug here would be probenicid. Over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for gout are primarily ibuprofen, brand names Advil or Motrin, and naproxen, brand names Aleve. Aspirin, also known as acetylsalicylic acid or ASA, is not recommended because it may abruptly increase uric acid levels in the blood and actually aggravate symptoms. Over-the-counter NSAIDs are typically non-selective COX inhibitors that inhibit the production of prostaglandins and they relieve both pain and inflammation, but they lead to more side effects, particularly stomach irritation, ulcers, and bleeding, compared to other analgesics, such as acetaminophen, like Tylenol. Dosages for acute gout, ibuprofen, about 800 milligrams every six hours. Of course, the maximum on that daily is 3,200 milligrams. And ibuprofen uh, at that level can be taken for between 4 to 10 days, but it depends on the length of the acute attack. Naproxen, a bit less, 500 milligrams twice daily seems to be effective for up to 4 to 10 days. Low-dose NSAIDs for up to 6 weeks is recommended for chronic gouty arthritis. Although some studies show that long-term use of NSAIDs actually accelerate cartilage erosion, connective tissue breakdown, and joint destruction. Prescription NSAIDs appropriate for gout are primarily indomethacin, brand name Indocin, Celindac, brand name Clinoril, and COX-2 inhibitors such as Celebrex. Dosages for acute gout, well for indomethacin it's 50 milligrams three times daily, recommended for two to seven days. Celindac is 200 milligrams twice daily, Go a little bit longer on that, 4 to 10 days. And Celebrex, 100 milligrams twice daily or 200 milligrams once per day for no more than one week. Celebrex is a little easier on the stomach because it's a COX-2 inhibitor, but it significantly increases risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. It's also much more expensive than the other drugs. 
For an acute attack, endomethacin can be tapered over the course of four days, for example, starting with 200 milligrams and then reducing it to 1, 50, and then 25 milligrams on the fourth day. NSAIDs in general are the drugs of choice for an acute gout attack in younger, healthier patients with no serious health problems involving kidneys, liver, or heart. They're not necessarily the first choice for older people with heart problems. For those at higher risk of gastric side effects from NSAIDs, an additional proton pump inhibitor drug may be given concurrently. For people unable to take NSAIDs or steroids, colchicine, brand name Colchris, is a viable alternative that effectively reduces gout pain, especially if it's started soon after symptoms appear. And that would be ideally within 12 hours, but at least within 24 hours. Colchicine is a derivative of the autumn crocus, also known as meadow saffron, and has been used for gout for literally centuries, but its effectiveness is offset by intolerable side effects in most people, and these effects include extreme nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Colchicine should not be used by elderly patients or those with kidney, liver, or bone marrow disorders. It may also affect fertility, so it should not be given to women that are pregnant. Certain medicines can interact with colchicine in a negative fashion, particularly some antibiotics and H2 blockers. The typical oral dose of colchicine for gout is 1.2 milligrams, followed by 0.6 milligrams. IV of colchicine is often avoided due to potential toxicities and extreme side effects. Corticosteroids may be used in patients who cannot tolerate either NSAIDs or colchicine, in particular the elderly. And it should be noted that corticosteroids should be considered equally as effective as NSAIDs in terms of inflammation and pain control. Cortisone and prednisone are strong anti-inflammatories that mimic adrenal hormones. And they can be injected into a gouty joint or taken orally if multiple joints are affected. But of course, joint infection should be ruled out because steroids suppress immunity and promote the spread of infections. Corticosteroid creams can be helpful locally, especially in isolated joints such as podagra. Triamcinolone is a long-acting synthetic corticosteroid given either topically, by injection, or even inhalation. Prednisone doses are between 20 and 60 milligrams daily for between two to three days and then tapered over one to two weeks. Intramuscular triamcinolone injection are usually 60 milligrams or 5 milligrams if injected directly into the proximal toe joint for podagra. Injections of corticosteroids are limited, approximately two to four per year, but it depends on many factors such as the size of the joint, the condition of the joint, the effectiveness of previous injections, and so forth. Xanthine oxidase inhibitors block production of uric acid in the body, primarily the liver, and help prevent acute attacks, but don't resolve them. So they're not meant to be taken at the time of an acute attack to reduce pain and inflammation. These inhibitors include allopurinol, brand name Xyloprim, and the newer drug, Febuxostat, brand name Euloreg. These inhibitors are usually administered one to two weeks after an acute attack has fully resolved. Ironically, these inhibitors may trigger a new attack if taken during a, an acute phase, but taking low-dose colchicine prior seems to reduce the risk. Overall, these inhibitors are well tolerated over the long term, and by that I mean many months or even years. The goal of using these inhibitors is to lower serum uric acid levels to between 5 and 6 milligrams per deciliter. If it does not lower to that level and there are recurrent acute attacks, then the gout condition is labeled as refractory gout, which is essentially considered untreatable. Allopurinol doses are between 200 and 300 milligrams daily for mild gout and up to 400 to 600 milligrams for moderately severe gout with TOFI. Normal serum urate levels are usually achieved within three weeks of using allopurinol. And Febuxostat 
requires a little bit less in terms of dosage, typically between 80 and 120 milligrams daily. Eurecosuric agents increase elimination of uric acid by the kidneys by preventing reabsorption and are usually preferred over xanthine oxidase inhibitors because under excretion of uric acid is thought to account for about 80 to 90 percent of hyperuricemia. These agents include primarily probenicid and sulfenpyrazone. Eurecosuric meds are strongly indicated if less than 800 milligrams of uric acid is collected after a 24-hour urine collection. But these meds are contraindicated in patients with a history of kidney stones. Only patients under the age of 60 with good kidney function who do not overproduce uric acid should take these agents. Probenicid doses are between 500 to 1,000 milligrams daily for about two weeks and can be increased up to 2,000 milligrams if needed and well tolerated. Peglotticase, brand name Christexa, was approved in the U.S. in 2010 to treat severe chronic gout. It's actually a recombinant porcine-like uricase, which metabolizes uric acid to elantuin. This is a good option for the 3% of people who are intolerant to the other meds previously mentioned. It's administered intravenously every two weeks and found to reduce uric acid levels and deposits of urate crystals in joints and surrounding soft tissues. Anakinra, brand name Kinneret, is an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist normally used to combat rheumatoid arthritis, but it's also effective for severe acute gout attacks, but not FDA approved to treat that condition. This drug blocks inflammation and cartilage joint destruction. It's administered via injection, typically 100 milligram doses, daily for many weeks as needed. Losartan is an antihypertensive, but it also seems to lower uric acid levels. And finally, phenophobrate is used to reduce fats and VLDL cholesterol in the blood, but it may also increase elimination of uric acid by the kidneys, so that's why it's sometimes used to combat gout. Surgical options for gout. Gout is often successfully treated by dietary changes and taking meds to relieve symptoms and alter the uric acid production and excretion. However, if gout is uncontrolled or deemed refractory and extensive tophi have formed around the joint, then surgery may be necessary to repair destruction, deformity, and to relieve pressure or clean out possible infections. These tophi can be excised, meaning cut off, or simply drained of surrounding pus and fluid. In severe cases, joint replacement or even amputation, if the joints are small enough, for example the toe, must be considered. 